morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of IMS 2014. Well done for everyone for making it bright and early to this panel, um, panelists and audience included. Um, the title of this morning's first panel is The Natural Selection of Nightlife in Ibiza. Um, what we're kind of getting at there is this idea of, um, there's a couple of, couple of themes, a couple of strands within it, but basically survival of the fittest, um, only the strong survive. Um, there's also a kind of element that there's a, a natural order to how things work in Ibiza that you can't really mess with, and if you do, it kind of, uh, it's gonna come back and bite you. And also, in, in keeping with the idea of natural selection, the idea that parties have to have some kind of element that makes them stand out for one another, to make them attractive and to make sure that they can, can work. Um, what are you laughing at? Just what you just said. <laughs> I think I, we were discussing before that we should just let Dave Vincent talk for the next hour because he's, uh, <laughs> he's already been entertaining us. And uh, just, just wait, wait, okay. I'll let you speak first. Um, the, 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 basic, the basic idea where this came from was last year we kind of, out, there was a consensus that everything kind of went a bit too far. Um, the idea of exclusivity and um, DJs playing in one place and with one concept and one theme kind of was well, just completely changed. And you had the likes of Dice, Blogger Dice, Marco Carolla, uh, Carl Cox, Jamie Jones kind of playing at each other's parties. Um, and it's kind of a, it was a consensus that really had kind of gone too far. Um, I'm gonna start with Dave. Why did this happen? I think uh, the club's kind of allowed it to happen, really. You know, it's been going for the last four to five years from once or even before like, Sankey's came on the... It's okay, sorry. Can everyone hear me? I think it's been going on for the last four or five years. As a, you know, it's been gradually developing. And then, you know, I think the last year kind of got abused. There was all this kind of like, a year of sharing, and let's be honest, it's all over bollocks, really. I mean, at the end of the day, it was just more greedy DJs and greedy agents wanting to kind of basically make as much money as possible. And that was to the detriment of Ibiza and probably to the clubs because I think everyone needs to come with original content. We were put in a corner where um, one artist and one agent put the pressure on us for that we had to do both clubs. And, you know, we kind of wanted to show that we wanted to keep our eyes, but it was a really bad decision for us and we would never ever do that ever again. And I don't think any other clubs would do that again, but I mean, we were practically blackmailed that if we didn't do it, we'd never work with that artist and that agency ever again. So I'm not gonna mention who it is, but I think people know. Um, is this then, who's to blame for this? Is this the agents, the artists? What, 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 where's this pressure coming from? I think it's all of us, at the end of the day, we can just tell them to fuck off, but you know, that's the truth. But I think that it, is, it comes from greedy agents. Greedy agents put, you know, at the end of the day, the artists, they just want to DJ, don't they? Yeah, of course they want to make money and they hide behind their agents and stuff like that. Not all wise, but certain eyes, you know? But if you get an, a certain agent who's a bit tricky, then they try to like work out any way to get, you know, that extra few thousand euros, you know? And last year was a summer of roulette for a lot of DJs and, and agents making this type of money. And it was to the detriment of, I think, of the clubs in Ibiza. And, you know, I think everyone should do their own original content. And that's what's going to keep it and push the, the island forward. Sir? I get that. Hello? Check, 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 check. Uh, I don't know. These are pretty far away from everybody. But, uh, yeah, I kind of have a different take on that. Um, I think a lot of the collaboration last year uh, stemmed more or less from the fact that there was so much content on the island, and a lot of the DJs are, are kind of, a bit better if I step in, okay. A lot of the DJs are somewhat friends, and there are so many different parties going on, you know? It's like, how can you create a better, unique selling point for your own event, you know? And it's to collab, you know, before, uh, you know, years ago when there was less parties, most of the bigger DJs were just all playing at one party, you know, Cocoon kind of had, um, a powerhouse in a way with everyone playing but you know when you have you know so many nights at Ushuaia so many nights at Space and these other places then the way to bring kids in is to stack up the headliners you know with each headliner having its own party it's a, each major kind of big techno kind of talent or DJ or whatever having its own event then it's like how else can you fill it out when it's like one night is you know, let's say in, uh, within our scene, Loco Dice, next night is Richie Hall, and we've got Circle Loco one night, then yeah, you're gonna have to bring some people over, you know? 
you're going to have to bring some people over from each night to really fill out the clubs. You know, these are thousands of people who are trying to get into the doors every night at, at all these clubs. And it's like, like David said, it is about having unique content. But when the content is oversaturated, then obviously you have to collaborate to really just make it work. Yeah, but in, in the example of, um, and I want to bring Jan in on this, in the example of uh, Loco Dice, I mean, he, he at times last year was kind of playing three gigs in a week and trying to hold down a residency. I mean, f from your perspective, how, how, how did that deal come about where he was able to play all those gigs but still maintain a residency with us, right? Yeah, we, we tried to be fair at the beginning of the season when we, when we spoke with all the, the artists and we didn't want to, to cut all the possibilities they, they had to play in other places. So we didn't thought uh, at all that uh, this would happen like that. No, they, we had some weeks that we had uh, a residency with artists like Dice or, or Luciano, and, and we had uh, uh, them playing five or six times in the island uh, in, in other places. We had three beach parties. We, uh, you had uh, parties in space, uh, guest talent with all the big DJs. It was too much uh, everywhere, and it was, at the end, everybody competing with everybody and uh, we lost a, a lot the, the essence of, of, of the party. It was all the, these big headliners which were playing uh, together in some, some parties like Cocoon before or, or much more in kind of group and, and pulling a lot of, of more crowd were sharing the, the cake now and playing everywhere uh, on their own and having their own residency. And it was, it was sharing, the, the, sharing the public and, uh, and that it's a business at the end, sharing the money. So you, you, you get uh, at the end competing uh, uh, everybody with everybody. You have to go down with prices of tickets. You can't uh, deliver the product you want to deliver to, to the public. And it's, uh, it, it became a big war when, uh, when it was not like this uh, before. Uh, there is a, um, there, we have to be very exclusive. You know, there's a really, and it, and it does help the club quite a bit. I know uh, we're allowed to play, or some of the bigger artists are allowed to play maybe two to three times outside of, of the actual club, and it does help the club's brand, you know? So that's like, even though the collaborations are really good and it's good for the people, it is detrimental to the to clubs and, and building a uh, following in many ways, you know? Steve from Pasha, did you have this issue last year? I mean, how, how did you deal with the issue of, how do you deal, uh, as a club, how do you deal with the issue of exclusivity with your artist? Yeah. Um, I don't know, um, <laughs> a lot of the time you're at the mercy of, of the DJ and, uh, and what they want to do with their own careers. Um, David Getter wants to play in Ushuaia because he wants to do the festival show there and he wants to play in Pasha because he wants to do the club show there. You know, I'm not going to argue with, with David wanting to do Ushuaia and do his festival show there, it's, it's fine. It's, it's popular enough, um, enough people to come to both, both venues. I think the biggest problem last year was not really about exclusivity and, and, and own content. I think it was really just economics. I mean, you know, the whole world had a massive global crisis last year. People had less money to spend. Um, the UK market, the UK tourists this year has got a bit more money in its pocket. You can already feel it in Ibiza right now. Last year, they didn't have a lot of money in the pocket, and so everybody felt Everybody felt the loss of that, and that happened right across Europe. You know, economies around the world seem to be bouncing back a little bit, and Ibiza seems to be already up from the last couple of years. So, I don't think it's really about exclusivity. I mean, it's great to have exclusivity, but uh, it's more about economics, whether a club works or not. And oversaturation. Dave? Uh, yeah, just a few things. I mean, well, I just want to make... Um, on record, uh, you know, I can blame the artists and the agents, but us as the clubs have to accept some blame as well at the end of the day because we accepted it. Um, we did warn, like, the agent that it was a really bad idea at the time, and they said, no, the artist is as big as David Guetta, and I said, are you really mad? Do you know what I mean? Like, do you really think that, you know? Could sell out Sankey's and a Schwire or Sankey's and a Pasha the same week, and I said, that's just not going to happen in a million years. And, you know, the amount of pressure that we had to do it, and we did it, but... It didn't happen. And, and just, just answering Seth's um, policy for DC10, their actual policy is that their artists can play any other club except Sankey's, which is fine, we accept that, it's, you know, but that is actually their policy. Um, I want to bring Andy in from Emerging Ibiza. Um, 
I want to get your take on this idea of, um, I mean, you can talk, talk to us about the festival in a minute, but um, this idea of, of new talent coming to the island, how are you um, working with the clubs to, um, to do that um, with the festival this year? Well, for, for us, it was, uh, it was always the case that we wanted to work with the community here and to help develop um, across a number of different um, clubs because, we, you know, for, for me, it was about sharing. And uh, the talent that we're bringing in is for a concerted period. So it's, it's, it's a, a, a five-day breakthrough festival. And then the, the, the residencies that we'll do with, uh, with some of the clubs throughout the season uh, are going to be at various venues and, and we're working closely with uh, you know, most of the guys here on, on, on putting those acts into the clubs. So I think it's important that you know, the, the, the new talent gets uh, a platform to be heard you know, and, and that you know, the, these guys are, are, are supporting us and we've had a, a lot of love in the room for it, so it's been great. How are you, um, I mean, again, to come back to the, the idea of the, the, the panel, the, the theme of the panel, this survival of the fittest, to, to break new talent and do it in that way is obviously really difficult because people come here and they want to go and see the big names and the, the big party. So how are you managing to, to give it some credibility and get people to uh, be interested in the project? Well, the, the way we sort of dealt with that was we brought um, experts in to curate the festival, so um, you know, people put forward their choices, their selections of the acts that they think will be big in the coming season, and uh, we put them together so that, uh, as a whole, that represents something that's uh, exciting and appealing. And then we also move that uh, concept around to various venues um, in order to. Uh, you know, bring those people to the attention of the people that might be going to those events already. So we have our own stage within a bigger uh, arena, as it were, so. Okay, uh, I want to switch back to, to Ushuaia and, and go, come to Jan. Um, I, I think with Use and Abuse last year, it was very much, um, well, there was, it, it was kind of a, a lot of fanfare, it was uh, heavily promoted. It was kind of a, a bold statement by Ushuaia to have a, a, an underground night alongside Luciano's. Why have you kind of dropped that and, and kind of gone as far to the other extreme as possible almost? I think last year what happened is uh, uh, we all thought during last winter that uh, uh, underground night was uh, able to compete uh, regarding numbers and incomes and VIP tables and everything and to full big, big, uh, big venues. And, uh, and having three underground nights in Ushuaia like last year was not the right choice uh, at all, businessly speaking. No, it's not not speaking about music. We're speaking about uh, uh, business there. And uh, and uh, for me, uh, there was too much underground nights in, in the island. We had not any problem with the commercial big uh, big crowd puller last year. We we really suffer because we had so much. Uh, uh, we created a bubble in the island last year with underground nights. You had you had on Mondays uh, Cocoon DC10 on Tuesdays. Uh, uh, you you had Carl Cox Wednesday. It was Paradise and it was uh, and it was uh, Guy Gerber. Thursday it was uh, Loco Dice and, and Enter. Friday you had Musicon. On Saturday it was Ants and and El Ro. Uh, you had underground nights everywhere in the island. So so it was. Too much competition, and, and um, you can't afford to pay uh, so big, big fees uh, requested for for one big headliner uh, underground. If you if you can't fill the venue, and, and it was not uh, not possible to all this uh, this uh, this business model in, in in our in our space. We have a big, big venue, uh, and and we need to do numbers. So if uh, maybe for that. Ants last year survived to, the, to, to this kind of, uh, of movement because we, we didn't have this cost and we can push uh, much more regarding promotion and we can play more with the cost of the entrance. Even if I have a big, big, big campaign uh, with, uh, with uh, use and abuse and, uh, and, uh, and if I'm bringing a few people, if I can't have a, a, a great price because the artist is, is a big cost for me, uh, if I can't charge at the door because under one people are not paying like commercial ones, uh, I, I, I'm not getting back in my in my number, so I can't have any balance. This year we we're coming back to a much more much more commercial line, which is uh, which is I think more more adapted to our venue with big big shows and big productions, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm securing the the, the business. No, and I'm, I'm, I know that with with Geta, Hardwell, Avicii, or 
or departures. I'm going to I'm going to do my numbers and I'm going to I'm going to sell uh, the tickets that I have to sell to fill my my place. Um, I mean, it, it kind of went so far with with Dice specifically that I mean, he's not even playing in a B for this year after what ten plus years of uh, being a resident and and playing so much. Why why do you think he's taking that decision? Um, I, sp I spoke with him. I was with him. Uh, we had breakfast together in uh, in uh, in Miami. We have a super good uh, good relation. And I think uh, for him, it's like uh, uh, a little break. I think he's, he's tired a little bit about uh, all this uh, this uh, competition and and the, the behavior and uh, of, of a lot of uh, of other artists and and people in the island. And I think he did right. He, he's going to give two, two, two great shows to the to the public. He's going to come for Carl Cox's birthday, I think, and he's going to do one one Sunday with Lynn uh, uh, at Space. And uh, and I think it's his decision. And and he, he was tired of uh, of the attitude of a lot of a lot of people in the island. And I and I think he's. He did the right choice. It's, it's going to be good. He's going to have two really great, great nights. Everybody's going to come to see him, and I think it's it's well done. Okay. Seth, Seth. Oh, I was going to ask you. Um, I mean, from from the artist's perspective, what's your take on him deciding to completely kind of take a break? I mean, there's there's a lot of points that we're looking at here. I mean, all right, uh, Jan said, uh, talked about the bubble. You know, really what we're looking at right now on the island is an oversaturation in kind of one genre of music. You know, like within our genre, within like underground, tech house, tech, whatever you want to call it these days, uh, there are too many parties. Like just flat out, there's too many parties to really sustain the amount of people coming to the island who are interested in that type of mu music. You know, uh, before the kind of, or how, how I mean, I only haven't been coming to the island for like five, six years or whatever. But before, there was a much more broader take of kind of different ideas and parties and events, you know, but from far different genres, from like tranny parties to, you know, cocoon or whatever. And now it's like really concentrated on our style of music, which makes things kind of financially hard for everyone involved. I mean, there, and it seems as well that like right now, since there's this meteoric rise of so many different artists, that it becomes this point where people who are seemingly friends really start to fight almost for territory you know, and creating their own brand and everyone's about, you know, accelerating their own brand instead of just taking their time or even really working in real collaboration, a collaborative way and creating kind of nice, nice events within like two or three people together could create something bigger. As far as the whole DICE situation, I mean, in some ways it is kind of a good idea because, I mean, from, from an outside view, I mean, I could, I could look at him, doing use and abuse at Ishwaya wasn't the best for his street cred you know, in many ways, you know? So taking a year out to let things cool and kind of wash that slate, I guess, is the better way instead of why come back, put more into this island when there's not really the space. I mean, it's, a, it's, actually, a, it's actually a clever move to step back a year, let it cool down, refigure out the situation, and then come back in. Because there's too many people here. There's too much going on. Um, Dave, uh, uh, you, Sankey's has always been kind of, um well, you've kind of marketed it, and, and you've been proud that it's a, a, an underground club. Um, is that fair to say? Not. I know we talked about this last year. We're not an underground club. But you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, but if, I, if people weren't here, I'd say we're not an underground club because you can't be underground. You advertise on billboards, posters, and flyers. It's not underground. Just reminded because some people might not be in there last yeah, year. Yeah, we discussed this last year. The point I'm trying to make is that you've taken some new nights, which you can talk about now and you tried to find a, a kind of uh, something unique about them, some of the new nights you've got this year? Of course. I mean, you know, we've got Tribal Sessions, which is my original baby. You know, it was 13 years, stopped in Manchester. We brought it back. And um, when we lost one of the nights, that was kind of one of the artists we shared with another club. Um, we came with the idea to bring back Tribal Sessions, which is my baby. And, you know, we had it yesterday. We had nearly 3,000 people in the club, and it was just unbelievable. I mean, the thing that separates Tribal Sessions from any other night is this, really. I thought I'd just give a bit of... Uh... <laughs> I thought Seth was going to turn up naked or something, so I just wanted to like, outdo him, you know? So, um... yeah, that's the Tribal <laughs> thing, so... <laughs> I don't know what you call that, a brand movement or some geriatric person who just went a feather on the panel, making himself look like an idiot, you know? But, so we've got tribal sessions on Wednesdays, and you know, Darius Irosian's like, you know, one of the artists, we booked 70 artists, you know, 
I think we've booked probably the most eyes for any, any night on the island, brought so many different eyes. And then we've got, um, as you know, we've got Fuse, um, which is, we, we got Duke de Mont exclusively, which is great, because they're two number ones in the UK. And he had bigger offers from another big club, but he, you know, fair play to him. He, he took half the money to join Sankey's, which was, you know, I respect in a big way. Um, Am Legend Dance, Thursdays, I think they're going to have a big season this year, you know? But have you, with, with, these, with these, these sounds, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're, there is a difference from last year. These are kind of, they have a unique um, following or they're kind of, a, it's a niche. Have you, have you done this deliberately because you can't have seven nights the same in, in the club? You can't. I mean, you've got seven nights that, are, like, that fit into our style club, you know, Duke de Mont's as far as we can take it, you know? I remember having this conversation with Jan in New York, because I had a different idea of program, and he said, don't go that way, do you remember? You know, and um, you know, I kind of took it on board. But um, yeah, Duke de Mont is as far as we can take it, more slightly, a bit more kind of commercial, but um, you try to do nights and try to make them as, as different as possible, but at the same time, when somebody comes into Sankey's, they kind of pretty much know what they're gonna get on the tin can. You know, um, Steve. Uh, last year was kind of a big transition for for Pasha, and I think it was a, a successful one. Um, you also kind of had a, 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 a an experiment, I guess, with Guy Gerber on a Wednesday, and he's, he's not going to be doing that anymore this year. Um, how did how did that experiment go? Yeah, I mean, we are doing Guy again this year. Um, we're doing them on four Fridays. Um, doing them on the Wednesday, it was it was difficult. It was difficult for Guy. It was difficult for us. We, you know, musically, it wasn't something that was expected in Pasha. But you know, Guy wanted to give it a go, and so did we. And he brought in some great talent. Um, you know, the, the the talent that he brought in. I mean, usually they're found, you know, in, in in other spaces, and and that audience, you know, like those other spaces, they came to us, but not in as many numbers as they should have done, as we expected they would have done. But it didn't mean that we stopped believing in Guy and Guy's music, and so we just wanted to reposition Guy and give him four Fridays, basically four big showcase parties, because when he took the wisdom of the glove party around the world, and it's been successful in lots of lots of territories all over the world. And so it's not something that we want to give up on. You know, we, you know, we believe in Guy Gerber and, and I think we've given him a bigger platform now. Friday in Pasha is, is generally, there's more people naturally. And, um, you know, hopefully Guy will then, you know, convert the masses to his sound. And he's got some great talent with him again. He has Green Velvet and Tigard and, you know, some, some, some good stuff. But yeah, it was an experiment and, um, you know, we took a chance on it. It didn't hurt us drastically, you know, we're still working with Guy and, um, you know, but, but we had to tweak and we had to fix it. You know, we couldn't just plow along blindly, you know, we had to learn from, from the mistakes. To, to, to put it bluntly, does, does this kind of go back to what we're talking about in terms of survival of the fittest? Essentially, he, he wasn't strong enough in, as a name to carry the, the party to warrant his own residency? Or? You know, Guy, uh, you know, also doing like, you know, 20 weeks in a row, it's, you know, it's not so easy that, you know, and, um, you know, the DJ's got to be a, a certain kind of breed to, to do 20 weeks and be that artist 20 weeks in a row, come what may. And so, you know, for Guy, it was a learning curve, you know, um, it, it's, it's difficult to be on 20 weeks and be that person. Um, you know, maybe you've had a bad day, maybe you've got a hangover or fell out with your girlfriend, but you've still got to be that, that artist. And, and what, um, what's going to be happening on Wednesdays in Pasha in, instead of Guy's residence? On Mondays, we have uh, Seth's favourite artist, um, Steve Aoki. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Seth. Yeah, uh, can you... Can, I mean, I, I think most people have read the, uh, the editorial. Can you just put it into kind of uh, summarise what your feelings are about Steve Aoki? Uh, I gotta, my feeling is just anyone who throws cakes in, a, in someone's face and calls it music uh, doesn't really have a, a page in my book. At the end of the day, I mean, it's it's not it's not our culture at all, and I, I mean, I'm really offended by it. I'm like highly offended that like someone really takes the time to like I've seen I've seen I've seen the guy play a couple times. I mean, this doesn't really have to do with our talk, but like he doesn't even mix. He t turns the music off, talks about his next single, and then throws a cake in someone's face. And if that has anything to do with what we're talking about on the stage, then I'll be damned to support it. Basically. 
Um, Jan, these, these artists, I mean, this, we, we talked before about, you know, you, your job is to fill your club and, and secure your business. Um, I know you're, you're as passionate about music as anyone on this panel. How, how do you balance the fact that artists in that field kind of have this, you know, they, they become stars in a way that, as Seth alludes to, the kind of, it's, it's not to do with the music per se, but to do with this show and brand and... Now you have you have uh, the possibility to create some 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 artists um, uh, with a little bit of music and a big part of marketing and and big part of production. It's it's sometimes uh, about a big and great show and and uh, and a big big and great marketing campaign. So so yes, you. I don't know if it's always about real m music, but. Uh, I think in all the different uh, uh, groups of, of artists that we have uh, at Ushuaia or, or everywhere, no, between electronic music, um, you have always talent. And I think that all the big headliners and all the big great uh, DJs uh, are there for something, even if it's for uh, because they are creative, even if because they have a big, big, great team around them. or. I mean, you have example of Avicii. Avicii is, is commercial. Avicii is a big, big headliner. He's winning a, a lot of money and doing big, big, uh, great shows. And he's a great producer. He's somebody that you put in a studio and he's able to, to do a lot of music and to create a lot of music. It's not the same style of music, but, uh, but he's able to, to do great, great, uh, great productions. So it, I think it, it, yeah, it depends of, 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 of artists. Dave, um, and I know you, um, you, you, you passionate supporter of, you will be willing to give someone a chance um, to prove themselves, and, and that's been shown down the years in, in the artists you supported and the nights you've held on to, but how do you, um, where do you draw the line in terms of giving someone the opportunity to, to show that they can have a successful party, and, and when do you, uh, yeah, call it, call it a day? Um, well, it's just numbers. I mean, if somebody has a bad yeah, season... The, the question is, is it just numbers? Would you ever give someone the room to...? Yeah, of course. I mean, like, for example, like Claude Von Stroke's party last year. You know, in its perceived success, it wasn't a financial success for Sankey's. And we, would, we, we were there to carry on. You know, we believed to carry on the next, you know, one to five years, but you couldn't commit to a residency the year after. And I just think that you just have to nurture things. If you think something's got legs, then, you know, you push it forward or... If some some things happen, then you just let it go. But you know, you know, um, flying circus. It wasn't promoted in the house. It was promoted by an outside promoter. The outside promoter lost a lot of money. It was it wasn't promoted in the correct way. But we've now taken in, in the house, and we believe that we'll make it work. So um, a lot of things is you know you look at like a three year plan. You ex you expect to lose money in year one. You know, and you know you just build it. But there's some things that you just think it's just not going to work. Like for example, you know, the you know a certain brand that wanted to come back and who came back the year before and we just didn't think it had any legs anymore you know so you just need to just know when to cut it okay i, I want to bring andy back in um the the concept of emerging ibiza is obviously to to give uh, an opportunity to new talent to have a have a face in ibiza um tell us a bit more about the experts you've got involved in and how they're kind of working with the artists to to, to promote the festival yeah, well, the, the, the whole sort of concept behind Emerging Arbitha is that, you know, for me, music is about where you heard it from. And if it comes from a, a source, a reputable source, that you uh, have faith in, then you're more likely to, uh, to look favourably upon the selection. So we put together um, a really kind of diverse panel. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've got people that are industry experts like Danny Whittle and Jan who, you know, select, obviously, for, for, for many years, the, the DJs that perform at, at the big clubs here in Ibiza. And we also put through, you know, some of the stalwart DJs, you know, that play at places like Sankey's, like Steve Lawler, um, you know, which, again, uh, is really important because they have acts that they want to nurture, that they want to encourage, that they want to give a platform to. And, um, you know, through doing it both online, through the digital um, platform that we've built, um, and then live with the touch points here in Ibiza at the, at the festival and season of events, I think we're allowing, uh, you know, 
that curated talent to uh, actually be looked upon favourably because they've been selected by those people that count. And, um, you know, I think that that really is the sort of, uh, is the unique opportunity that we're given the artists and, uh, you know, the, the support from that. Uh, and just tell us again that the festival takes place next week. Yeah, I mean, th th that was the other thing. We worked with these guys to look at a good week that would work well for them in the, in the calendar. And obviously, you know, historically now, IMS has built up a reputation, brings a lot of people in here, and then it's the opening weekend. It goes straight up to, you know, your Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, and then we're just in that pocket between uh, Tuesday right the way through to Saturday when um, Amnesia opens. So. Uh, we've worked with, uh, you know, some of the local bars and, uh, you know, we open at Sands uh, on Tuesday the 27th in the afternoon. Then we go to Space. Uh, then we're working with the Zoo Project and the Ibiza the Boat Festival on the Wednesday. And then uh, we've got a, a pool party at Santos on the Thursday, which is a boutique hotel in Bossa, followed by Sankey's on Thursday night. And then we're at the Ushuaia Tower all day Friday for uh, a, a big sort of 12-hour uh, extravaganza. And then um, we have access to ants for all of our weekly badge holders on the, uh, on the Saturday. So that's the dates, that's the week. Okay, good luck. Um, Seth, I want to bring you back in. You mentioned before that uh, about DC10 exclusivity and... Um, yeah, it's obviously a kind of very tightly controlled and because of the, the influence of DC10 artists kind of, I guess, bow to that, uh, not pressure, but that kind of uh, influence from the club. Yeah, but, not, the, but that hasn't stopped you playing in other places. Though. Yeah, it doesn't, it's not like we really bow to it. It's like we're happy to be, to be part of that situation and be part of that family. I mean, uh, I'm allowed to, I, I, I play a couple different places. But I play only three different different shows a year. I, I always play for Cocoon. They're, they're uh, a, good, a good group of friends who I like to support. And I also support a few other parties. Like this year, I'm only playing at Cocoon and then one for El Ro, you know, just trying to keep it really down. I mean, it's, it's a lot of times about collaborating with other artists or other teams that you also respect or, or like um, really want to push, push their, their brands as well. But the thing with Circle Loco, and that I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of, and people ask me often, you know, I mean, and Circle Loco is not a thing about money. We all get paid the same amount of money. Everyone gets 500 euros a week. It's down the line, you know? And it's very kind of straight line that way. And people ask me often, they're like, hey, Seth, you know, things are going really well for you. Are you thinking about going for a night? These type of things. And I have no thought in my mind that I would ever want to leave or go for a night because it's such a comfortable situation. I mean, for me and what I stand for and what that brand stands for and what that the history of, of that club stands for fits ex exactly in line with my own kind of moral and musical and artistic ideas, you know, and to be part of a situation where I can express musically what I want as well as be in a situation where the foundations of that music are expressed. The same with Cocoon, you know, it's about our culture and that's something that I want to be a part of. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing and I think the other DJs feel the same way. You know, there's some things you go do for money and there's some things you do for yourself and you do for the music. And that's, that's really what's, what's, uh, what's, what, what it's about, being part of Circle Loco, I think, for all the artists. I, I think, uh, Dave, I want to ring you back in as well. Is, at Sankey's, you have um, a, a kind of, I guess, a similar philosophy that you kind of want to cut the bullshit and just kind of make it all about the music. Um, are you trying to create a family kind of atmosphere as well for artists when they come to the club? Yeah, of course. I mean, we've got our, you know, we, we've got our own stable of artists. And you've got quite a lot. And, you know, we've definitely got the Sankey's family, for sure. I wanted to ask you, I mean, you opened Sankey's three years ago in Ibiza? Four? Well, yeah, it's three years, but it's that fourth season, yeah. And last year was the first year you did seven nights That we, week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, traditionally, I mean, going back ten years uh, or more, clubs weren't always open every night. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, uh, it seems strange to me that people feel the need to place uh, a night on a, on a Monday just to fill the gap, which means that it's inevitably going to fail. And it's kind of the, the week, because it's going to be a week party. I mean, how have you made the decision to go for seven nights rather than picking three or four strong ones? Because I like, I'm mentally insane. I like taking a lot of work on. No, <laughs> I don't know, I just find it a challenge, you know, if you can go and, you know, 
program your club seven nights a week and make it work, then that's a challenge, you know? At the end of the day, we've, you know, in Ibiza, we've only got, say, 120, 130 days to trade, and, you know, we need to make the most out of it, you know? And at the same time, you know, I love music and I love putting on pies, and, you know, I want to be in a position where we can go and book as many eyes and I can hear it play at my nightclub, and at the same time, you know, I, I like the idea of breaking new eyes and, you know, helping have other new kind of nights, you know, develop. So you can only do that if you do seven nights, you know. If you do two or three, you can only have 30% of the, the content of what we've got, you know. Sankeys, we're booking, you know, up to 50 to 60 DJs every week. We're probably booking the most DJs on the island now. Did you, though, after doing seven nights last week, consider to, to go back to doing less? No. At the end of the day, we went up, Sankeys went up 120% last year. 120%. So it worked with some things that didn't work. I'm lucky as well, you know, I'm working with Danny Whittle, an absolute legend, who's at Sankey's now, and he's helped me with programming, you know. He was the director, you know, of programming in Pasha in their glory days, you know, in their recent glory days. And, you know, working with him is, you know, is an absolute honor. And, you know, I can, I've got somebody that I can bounce with and if I'm making a mistake, I just ask him because he's been there and, and done it. And, you know, there's some great ideas that he's put into the club. So I think that, you know, we could equally maybe go up again in, on that level again okay. with what we're doing. And as long as you just keep on refining what you're doing, you'll go forwards and not backwards. You know, you're going to make mistakes. But like what Lohan said yesterday from Ministry of Sound, you know, you have to make mistakes to have success. Um, Jan, last year you um, and with Ushuaia Tower kind of were in a situation where you kind of almost were competing against yourself. Yeah. How did you, I mean, that's obviously a lesson that you've learned because this year you, you're not going to be doing the same. No, we're not, we're not going to do anything downstairs in the, in the pool. The pool was, was a free access, so it was can, a kind of cannibalism against, uh, against uh, Ushuaia. Uh, the big one, so we're going to do only on the roof, like uh, kind of after parties, uh, just after Ushuaia, bringing the people of downstairs to, to the roof with some, some, uh, some special DJs uh, there after, but we're not going to uh, compete against, uh, against ourselves. Um, and, and Hard Rock, who's, who's coming to play there? <laughs> the lineup is, is nearly done. We, we're gonna, it's something really mixed. No, the capacity is not so, so big. But um, we're going to start with Nile Rogers on, on the 13th. Then uh, uh, we have Nene Cherry, UB40. Um, we're going to have uh, Robin Fick uh, on the 4th of, uh, of July. Uh, Icona Pop, the, the 18th is uh, still free. Uh, then we have Jason Derulo. We have a Radio One weekend. We are going to do Ellie Golding, Snoop Dogg for concerts. Um, we have uh, Kylie Minogue on the 22nd of, of August. Then we have uh, the big uh, corona event uh, at, uh, at Hard Rock with, uh, with uh, Ben and, and Disclosure Live. Um, then we have Pitbull, uh, Placebo, and, and we are ending the deal for the closing party. Okay. Um, St Steve, I, I want you to come in and tell us a little bit about Destino and what you're doing there this year, and explain what it is and where it is for people who don't know. Yeah, Destino is... Um it's a, a Pasha Hotel and, and Resort. Um, it's up in Talamanca. It's a, a beautiful spot. And um, uh, last year we, we run a series of events up there um, with people like Solomon and Art Department. Uh, Nicholas Jar did a concert up there. And, um, you know, we, we, we found, you know, the island really supported that. We had big numbers um, for all of those events. And we actually, um, we run them as, as free events as well, actually, you know, it was, uh, it was like welcome one and all. And, uh, yeah, and, and people came in, in, in thousands. I mean, to see Nicholas Jar up there in front of 4,000 people was, was incredible. Uh, Cocoon's closing party there was magical, just in, incredible. And this year we're doing um, uh, much of the same. Um, you know, Cocoon are coming back. Um, <coughs> Solomon's coming back, Luciano's coming up to do some stuff. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to a nice season of that. Okay. Um, 
I want to give us plenty of time for questions, so um, I'm going to go to the floor. If you can uh, just tell me who you are and who you represent and um, before you speak. Yeah, oh, there's someone going around with the mic, so if you put your hand up, and uh, welcome to you. Open floor, the question. Anybody has some questions? Nothing? Nothing. This is where you do your monologue. Oh, yeah, did I just talk yeah. and ramble, ramble nonsense? Um, yeah. IMS has been great, huh? Wow. There's not a single question. So, uh, I met a cat. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Hi, my name is Fabrice. Uh, I have a question regarding the progression to, uh, to Jan. Um, on the long term run, don't you believe is there a risk for the Ibiza uh, positioning perception of uh, Clubbing Island going into more live concert, live artists? Do, do you believe? In French, if you want. Ah, in French, you can do it. No, I'll do it in English, like that, everyone. With the program that you unveiled right now, with, uh, with um, with uh, UB40, all these artists that you said before, yeah. is there a risk on the long-term run for the island to not be any more perceived as the clubbing island, the electro island, going into live concert, live performance? No, I think it's, uh, it's another offer. We, we are n in the case of Ushuaia, we are not going to be open when it's a hard rock concert, so it's going to be closed. We are not going to compete uh, Ushuaia against hard rock. And I think it's bringing something else to, to the island, a new, a new concept. Uh, I think there's, there's public in the island uh, uh, to, to see this kind of, uh, of live act and uh, I think it's great, I think it's a, it's a new, new opportunity to, to see something different in the island. It's, not, it's afternoon time, it's the same timing than Ushuaia, we're stopping at 12 and uh, yeah, it's another, another option, I think. I think as well, um, to go back to the theme of the, the panel, um, uh, Juan from Space isn't here but he, he would openly admit that uh, during the last few years, they tried and tested live, live kind of PAs and live shows in in space that kind of didn't really work. They just didn't fit and suit space. Um, so kind of the natural order of Ibiza was that uh, it didn't work, and they went back to doing traditional club shows. And then the live stuff can take place in outdoor arenas like uh, Ushuaia or Ibiza Rocks. So, any more questions? Hi there, my name is Jack. Um, I have a question for Seth. Um, you say the tech house scene is saturated um, with parties, etc. How do you see a solution to that? Uh, how do I see a solution to the oversaturation and, and dance music in general or tech house in general? I don't know if there's really uh, a solution. I think maybe um, instead of people trying to do so much, it'd be maybe more beneficial for everyone to kind of tone it back. I, I don't know, it's, it's really uh, a question, I think, of content and quality control more than anything, right? Right now, uh, let's say, like, you look at Beatport or you look at anywhere in electronic music, there's so much coming out where before with uh, record labels or with pressing records, there's a lot more quality control, you know what I'm saying? Because it t costs a lot more money to put out the product. So uh, today with Kind of, I, I mean, there's, there's no way really to control it. I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, trends will change. That will probably take out a lot of people as well. And I mean, there's, it's, just, it's just hard to really kind of put a, a fine point on how you can change that. But how you can change that on the island is maybe just more quality control to the nights. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but there, there is too many people. I mean, there, there are far too many p parties. I mean, even in, uh, if you look at going to New York, or I was just staying in New York for um, whatever, three months at the beginning of the year, and on any given weekend, there was 50 to 60 RA parties that were like RA tech house parties or techno parties, and that's too many, too many parties for any city or any scene to really keep up with. And that's, at the end of the day, burst the bubble. That's going to be the end of all of us. So, I mean, it's, it's just something to consider more than something that, like, it's really my point or my, my goal to, to you know, make a, 
make a, you know, to make that change, you know? I mean, I can think for myself, and the one thing I've tried to take up is the quality, you know? Going, I've, two years ago, I went back to playing records. I've tried to go more to the essence of what I kind of consider underground dance music to be, to, to break myself away of like kind of the monotony of what is current tech house kind of music or culture. So if artists want to really break away from like, I guess, what is uh, becoming an oversaturated situation, then them investing more time into their kind of craft and coming up with new ideas, and new ideas are the only way that's really gonna put us forward or kind of differentiate yourself from the rest of the crowd. I have one question though. Uh, there's two people in the room. We've got uh, Tom here from Desolate and uh, Johannes there in the back from Cocoon. And I would like to hear uh, their particular views on what, uh, what, what could be happening in the future or what their views are on uh, the politics and, uh, of the island and what, what our kind of keynote yeah, panel is about. Tom. Tom is here. Tom is here. Uh, he, he seems kind of sleepy, so, but Johannes is in the yeah. back. He seems, he seems Tom, in the Tom, Tom, Tom is uh, local Dice's agent. Agent That's right, manager. manager. So can you tell us from your point of view what Dice is, uh, why he's made the decision to, to not come to a for this year or he's only doing the two shows and he's taking a step back? Well, um, Dice had a relationship with Cocoon for over 10 years and what you do when you break up a relationship after 10 years, you try different things out, you know, and um, it's quite funny to hear the politics that we had or the strategy that we might have had last year. There was actually no strategy. We had Dice um, played for all his friends, for Marco, for Richie, for came back to the C10. And um, most of the gigs, he not even charged any fees. He don't, he don't give a shit. He was uh, trying out different things. And of course, Ushuaia was a try. And um, we knew from the beginning, and we discussed with Jan um, that we would not not want to put everything on one card, we want to keep our club shows, because as Steve said, it's a totally different concept of party. Ushuaia is a um, festival show, and Amnesia is a club show. And um, it was important for us to keep this pressure of a club show, and also have um, the experience of a daytime party for the people. So, but um, exactly like Jan said, DICE was a little bit tired um, this year, because after we announced that we're not going to do Shwaya, there started a little war, where is Loco Dice going now and what's going to happening? And um, Dice said, oh man, I don't want to be part of this now. So um, it, it he said, was, let's it, step back. It was, a, it was a case of the politics was just too much. Sorry? The politics was just too much. He the wasn't. huge politics. No, the, so, the politics of the bidding war. No, I, I mean, we, we was basically a little bit stuck, so um, we, we couldn't really move somewhere without stepping on somebody's feet. And, um, and the politics was so big that Dice not wanted to be even involved in this. I said, you know, I can step a year back and come back next year, so it doesn't harm him. <laughs> Nothing gonna happen. So, um, yeah. And I think this is Ibiza's routine. Huh? Every year something new. Uh, Johannes? Can we get, can can we we get the, mic? the mic back here? I mean, Cocoon, Cocoon has gone through a kind of a, like a, a wave up and down and uh, years, right? peaks and troughs over 15 years. And, and a lot of the artists who now have their own residencies started in Cocoon um, and played there regularly and, and still were playing there regularly. From, from your perspective, um, have you had to kind of reinvent what Cocoon stands for over the last couple of years when this happened? I mean, last year we were sitting, he, well, I was in the, in, in the Grand Hotel and there were almost the same people sitting, sitting uh, at the panel talking about the new Ibiza, that the underground is so big now and that there's space for everyone to have their own party and to host their own nights and, to, and it's, uh, that it will change Ibiza forever because there's no more exclusivity and everybody can play for, for whoever. And uh, it's now interesting to see that and to hear that it didn't work. And it was for us clear from the beginning that a music that is still a niche can't turn into mainstream, not in Ibiza. And, and as all the nights were on in June, it, was, it, it took us two weeks to realize that exactly this will happen, that the bubble will burst, and it burst. So this year, I mean, there are less parties, 
of course. And I think it is now the time to, to bring people together again and not to departing them with their own nights. And uh, this was the whole idea why we, we, we are back with Luciano, because he was also one of them that realized, like, hey, it's not only about having the own party and uh, getting the big cash in. There is, there is a bigger idea about it. And this is that, well, the Seth said, there is a family idea behind DC-10. And there, there was always a big family idea behind Cocoon. You know, we, we were always under one roof and it made it easy for the people to, to, to decide where to go because there was only a handful underground nights. Last year wasn't. But um, I'm really confident that the market as always regulates itself. This is what happens. And we are going into the 15th season. Really looking forward to it and uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, uh, there are probably quite a few other people in the room who could give a, a similar opinion, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So um, thank you to the panel. And um, I think, Seth, you've got a keynote speech next. So if you want to see that, stick I, around. I, let's have to move forward, I guess. Yeah, so thank you to everyone on the panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.